Good. Good morning, everyone. As is the case on most Tuesdays, Governor Scott is currently on a COVID-19 call with fellow governors and White House officials, but he'll, he'll be joining us shortly. I'm Mike Smith, Secretary of the Agency of Human Services, and I'll start off with an update on our progress with vaccination and uh, as well as remind everyone of the numerous opportunities to get a, your shot throughout the state. Commissioner Pichek will present our weekly modeling, follow, followed by Dr. Levine with a health update. And then Governor Scott will join us and provide an update from his meeting and offer additional remarks. First, beginning this Thursday, I want to announce that we are removing the residency requirement for vaccination. This means that anyone age 12 and older who lives in Vermont or is visiting Vermont can get vaccinated in this state. You do not have to be a part-time resident. As you know, we opened registration for youth age 12 to 15 last Thursday. As of this morning, more than 9,000 12 to 15 year olds have made appointments. We are making good progress with this age group, but I will continue to urge young people to sign up. I also want to remind everyone that consent is needed from a parent or guardian. You can sign up online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, or you can call 855-722-7878 to make an appointment. There will be doses available for walk-ins at most locations. However, if you are age 12 to 17, you are only able to walk in with a parent or guardian or with a signed paper consent form and a filled in pre-vaccination checklist. If a child forgets their form, in many schools, the schools will reach out by telephone to obtain consent from the parent or guardian. Let's move on to the convenient opportunities to get vaccinated this week. If we can go to the first slide, you can see the pop-up vaccination clinics. Yesterday, we started the Wyndham County barnstorming event. Today in Wyndham County, we'll be vaccinating at the Wynn Hall Fire Station and the Londonderry uh, Ambulance Service. Tomorrow, we'll be in Deerfield uh, at the Deerfield Ambulance and Thursday at Searsburg Town Offices. Also on Thursday, you can get your vaccine at North Beach in Burlington. No appointment is necessary. This Friday, you can get your shot at Lancaster, New Hampshire Fairgrounds by appointment or walk-in. There will be an opportunity at Church Street in partnership with the City of Burlington on May 22nd. You can see the dates and locations on this slide. If you can go to the next slide, uh, this is emergency uh, emergency Medical Services Week, as Governor Scott proclaimed, this week is an annual recognition to thank the 2,800 men and women who make up Vermont's EMS system for their dedication and commitment. They play a critical role as first responders in our community every day, and their response during this pandemic has been remarkable. For example, when we asked EMS to mobilize and vaccinate homebound Vermonters, they were excited and ready. When we asked them to facilitate mobile clinics, they did so with flawless execution. They also assisted with other community-based vaccine and COVID-19 testing initiatives. And now during EMS week, they are opening their doors to the public, creating a festive environment and allowing people to walk in and get vaccinated. I cannot express enough our gratitude to the fine group of men and women. They have been an exceptional partner throughout the very difficult and exhausting year. All I can say is this, thank you. And the way we can thank them, all of us, is to show our and to show our appreciation and support is to attend one of their clinics this week and get vaccinated. It may be fun. As a reminder, there are 31 EMS clinics uh, locations this week, and will and they all are walk-in only. And if you can see, if you go through the various slides here um, from the the week, um, the 33 are listed here. You can also go 
onto the website at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine to look for the locations, times, and other opportunities to make appointments or walk-ins. But as I've said, I've listed it on the screen here for websites that you can go to uh, to get more information about vaccines. Turning to school-based clinics, we started them yesterday, and more than 100 clinics are scheduled. 66 of them are in schools. As a reminder, families and children in this age group will be eligible to go to any site across the state that offers the Pfizer vaccine, and all sites will be open to the public. Parents and family members who are unvaccinated are welcome to get vaccinated right along with your child. You can find a list of school-based clinics and register at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. You can also register at Kinney's, Walgreens, and CVS websites. And the first wave of vaccine clinics for restaurant, hospitality, and tourism workers has been completed. We do have an event scheduled at Sugarbush in Warren today. We, we are in the process of organizing the next wave in this sex, sector, along with vaccine clinics for work sites and at parks, including Vermont State Parks. To see all dates, times, and locations for these hospitality uh, worker vaccine clinics, please visit accd.vermont.gov vaccine or healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. Although we are still operating larger vaccine clinics through our healthcare partners and the Vermont National Guard, we are also transitioning to more localized and smaller settings in order to bring vaccine to Vermonters where they live and work. Even though these may be smaller events, it is still important to the overall effort to vaccinate as many Vermonters as possible. I urge Vermonters to take advantage of these efforts and as we strive to increase our nation, as we strive to increase our nation leading vaccination effort. In terms of overall progress, we are closing in on that 400,000 number. As of yesterday, 393,700 people have been vaccinated against COVID-19. 97,700 re have received their first dose of the vaccine. 296,000 have received their first and last doses. For those that follow it, um, I have three numbers here that you can, uh, you can write down. Eligible Vermonters for vaccine, those are Vermonters 12 and above with at least one dose. We're at 73.8% of that population. For Vermonters 18, with it, at least one dose, and I use that because President Biden uses that measure. Uh, Vermonters 18 plus with at least one dose, we're at 78.1%. And all Vermonters, those that are eligible and those that aren't eligible, all Vermonters with at least one dose, we are at 65.2%. Um, for those who have yet to be vaccinated, particularly those between the ages of 12 and 29, we have your vaccine ready and waiting for you. Please come and get vaccinated. The time is now. I will end there. Thank you once again for getting your shot, Vermont. I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for our weekly modeling update, and then Dr. Levine for the medical update. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary Smith, and uh, good morning, everyone. Today's report is uh, rather straightforward, containing uh, plenty of good news as our trends continue to be favorable and our future remains optimistic. Vermont's high vaccination rates continue to lead to favorable trends in cases, hospitalizations, and fatalities. This week, Vermont is reporting 350 eight new COVID-19 cases, about 30 fewer than last week, and our seven-day average fell 24% this week and is down an impressive 75% since April 1st. Vermont also has fewer active COVID-19 cases than at any point during the last six months, with fewer cases circulating and with vaccin vaccination rates pushing higher, our communities are getting safer by the day. 
For example, there are currently no active outbreaks in any long-term care facility in Vermont. The first time this has occurred since we started reporting active long-term care facility outbreaks last November. Taking a, a closer look at case demographic data, we can see that each of the age bands continues to see their cases decrease as their vaccination rates push higher. However, note that still the case rates remain higher in the age bands that have the lower vaccination rates. Again, a good reason for everyone, including that age group that Secretary Smith just referred to, to step up and get vaccinated. Looking at our case forecast, we see that our seven-day trend continues to closely track the April 26th forecast and that our updated modeling anticipates that these favorable case trends will continue into the foreseeable future. But again, we can uh, make sure that these case rates drop more quickly if we continue to step up and get vaccinated at the rates that we have been. The hospitalization rate in Vermont continues to drop uh, to the lowest level in the past six months. Our hospitalization rate has declined by over 19% this week and has fallen 34% over the last two weeks. And Vermont continues to have the lowest number of individuals who are currently hospitalized on a per capita basis in the country. And most importantly, we forecast that these favorable trends will continue for the foreseeable future. Similarly, Vermont's COVID-19 fatality rate remains low and we continue to forecast that May will have the fewest COVID-19 fatalities in the last six months. The willingness of Vermonters to step up and get vaccinated is why we're seeing such favorable trends. And for the second week in a row, Vermont continues to lead four important CDC vaccination metrics, total doses administered, the percent of our population with at least one dose, and the percent of those 65 and older who have started and also who have completed vaccination. Although the rate of new Vermonters starting vaccination has fallen this week, we continue to have the highest rate in the country and well above the national average with thousands of new Vermonters starting the vaccination progress on a daily basis. And as Secretary Smith just mentioned, under our Vermont Forward Plan, you can see our vaccination rate continues to surpass the previous goals we had set out today, standing at 65.2% of Vermonters who have received at least one dose. Looking at the region, we see that for the sixth straight week, conditions are improving around us in the Northeast. Cases this week total just over 28,000, the lowest weekly total in over seven months, and representing an 8,800 case decrease compared to last week. And again, over the last five weeks, cases in the region have fallen 70%. Hospitalization rates are also down across the region, as are fatalities. And probably most importantly, the Northeast is leading the nation in the uptake of the vaccine, with all six of the New England states in the top 10 on the percent of their population having started vaccination. This means that we expect these favorable trends to continue, and our regional forecast anticipates that cases will fall uh, in the next six weeks to the lowest levels that we have experienced during the pandemic. Continuing to paint a very optimistic picture, for the Northeast and for Vermont. Now at this time, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. I will begin with my usual data overview daily cases ranging from the 20s to the 60s in recent days and the 30s yesterday. Percent positivity, 1.2%. For the first time in uh, a long time, we are under 10 hospitalizations at nine, with one in the ICU. Unfortunately, there have been two additional deaths, I believe bringing the total for the month to five. But the one data point that we care about the most is the vaccination rate, because this alone is what impacts all of the others right now and points to why we are doing so well on all of the other metrics. 
There's a small technical issue with updating the online vaccine dashboard that should be resolved soon. But as you heard, our rates are not only good, they are leading the nation and they continue to improve. It's important to remember that with so many Vermonters vaccinated already, the percent of increases on any given day may appear to be slowing, but that's just a relative perception resulting from the successes we've so far achieved. Each and every newly vaccinated person is an additional step toward the pandemic finish line. As the saying goes, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And thanks to each of you, we are almost there. The work is not over, but we really need to take a moment to celebrate how far we've come together. It's because of Vermonters' willingness to protect themselves and one another, because of the hard work of everyone involved in the pandemic response, and because of so many partners and providers who've done everything from outreach to actually hosting clinics. You've already heard about EMS Week, but since we at the Health Department work to support our emergency medical service agencies year-round, I would like to add my own and our own profound thanks to each of them for their role as a public health force throughout the pandemic and every day. To name just a few of their critical accomplishments, EMS has developed a non-emergency transportation network to help COVID positive and suspected positive patients reach testing and medical appointments. Staffed COVID testing sites, conducting conducted emergency respirator fit testing for skilled nursing facilities, created in-home or on-site testing capability to work with outbreak prevention and response, developed in-home vaccination capabilities to reach homebound Vermonters with nearly 4,500 vaccinated. And of course, they've taken on a huge and significant role in all vaccination efforts from giving shots to people in skilled nursing facilities, state vaccination clinics, correctional facilities, schools, and group living settings, and through drive-in and mobile clinics. That includes reaching more rural areas where people might have a harder time accessing the vaccine. For all of these reasons, and for what EMS does in their everyday role to care for us, I hope you'll join me in saying thank you. And if you haven't yet been vaccinated, that you'll stop into one of the many clinic sites EMS is hosting around the state. You can get more information on our website, healthcare, health, sorry, healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. I'd like to remind those who have not yet gotten vaccinated that even if you're not that concerned about protecting yourself, your decision to get vaccinated can still make a big difference for those around you, especially for children who can't yet get vaccinated. As I said, the more people who are vaccinated, the fewer chances the virus has to move on to the next person. And if the virus does come into Vermont, even if it's a variant, our high vaccination rates create a wall of immunity. This stops it from spreading further. Less transmission between people means less chance for new mutations and new variants. The vaccine works, plain and simple. Vaccination equals protection. It protects against the variants we've seen. Data shows vaccinated people are unlikely to spread the virus. We have great vaccination rates here in Vermont and we're going to keep doing even better. This is why we can ease up on masks and distancing for fully vaccinated people. And why the Vermont Forward Plan makes sense and is even possible. Now there are many who are completely comfortable with the new mask policy and say, what took you and the CDC so long? But at the same time, I know for a number of you, the changes will take some adjustment. And I witnessed myself over the weekend, both people masked and unmasked in indoor and outdoor settings. I also know there are businesses that continue to have people wear a mask in their establishments until all of their employees can get fully vaccinated. That's totally fine, and I applaud their concern for the health of their staff. That is why you should continue to keep a mask with you when you're out and about, to respect the policies of businesses and the setting 
you might find yourself in, whether you plan to be there or not. And again, please don't judge. None of us can know anyone's unique situation. Maybe there's a staffer who goes home to people who, are, who can't be vaccinated or who might be immunocompromised. Patience and understanding is the what's required during this transitional time. It's also okay for fully vaccinated people to be thoughtful about their decisions and observe how others behave before changing their own behaviors. Wanting to protect yourself and others has been so ingrained in us now, I can certainly understand. It is only natural to have some anxiety about this as well. What about the pandemic hasn't given us some shared anxiety? But know that when you're ready, you can have confidence in the vaccine's protection. Even if you unknowingly encounter an unvaccinated person, the vaccine is highly protective against all of the most serious outcomes. And if you're not yet vaccinated or are just waiting for your full vaccination day to arrive, please keep up masking and distancing so you don't put others at risk. We know Vermonters will make the right choices to bring us all out of this pandemic together safely. Don't see the governor yet on the scene, but it shouldn't be too long, but we'll start with the uh, questions. Yep, and uh, the governor will be a few more minutes, so for the reporters on the line, if we get to you and you need to get another question for the governor, just let me know and we can come back to you after he arrives. But first up, we'll start with Calvin Cutler, WCAX. Um, thank you. I think I'll wait for the governor for my question. Okay. Steve Longchamp. Well, I might as well ask one of the doctors since he's right there. Um, this is uh, EMS week. Uh, a lot of the, uh, there's a problem with finding volunteers. Most of them are volunteer uh, agencies in the state. Um, is, along with getting that vaccine, it's probably a good time if you can to volunteer maybe. So a good time for recruitment is what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, so obviously if someone has an interest, uh, they're gonna have plenty of people around the state to talk to. Uh, not having to seek them out very aggressively because they're there waiting to talk with them as well as vaccinate them. But I think what you're referring to is nationwide, not just in Vermont, but especially in rural America, um, volunteerism in general is suffering, uh, EMS being one of those areas, uh, but it also expands to things like volunteer fire departments and other entities. Uh, so step up if you have an interest uh, and want to share in some of the work that they do because it's such good work. It's very rewarding. I've talked to people all the time about this and uh, it, it would be gratifying uh, not only to the EMS workforce to have you join them, but to yourself. Any other question, I guess, we'll, might as well, we were talking about this earlier. Of those who have, um, have passed away uh, in the last month or two, What's the age range? What's that profile look like? Yes, so I'm not noticing anybody in the below 60 age range or below 65. By and large, it's still 65 and older, occasionally in the 65, 70s, sometimes still in the 90s. Uh, so it really spans that entire older Vermonter spectrum. The vast majority are uh, non-vaccinated, but there have been a couple that are either partially or fully vaccinated. Stuart Ledbetter, NBC5. Thanks, uh, Jason. Yes, if I could, um, if I could circle back when the governor's here. Sounds good. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, thank you, Jason. I have a question for uh, Commissioner Harrington about uh, the unemployment insurance situation. And do you feel that uh, you have the fraud situation um, in hand now? And when do you expect to go reopen the online system? Uh, thanks, and appreciate the question. Uh, in general, the fraud situation is under control in that when we took the online application down, uh, our numbers dropped significantly of claims being filed. 
I don't think fraud is going away. Uh, they're just looking for other opportunities to get into systems across the country. Um, so specifically for us, you know, our claims went from thousands a day. I think the most recent number I saw for like yesterday alone was only 64 claims. Uh, on Saturday, it was eight claims. Um, so again, uh, that's really good for us in terms of volume and helps provide our staff with some cover so that they can, you know, look a little more deeply into those claims. Um, I think the question about whether we're, when we will put it back online is really more about when we can do so and not see that volume pick up again. Um, we haven't received any complaints with people needing to call our call center to have their claim filed and have an agent walk through the claim with them. In some cases, it actually provides additional uh, support and guidance to them because they can ask questions as they go through the application. Um, but I think from that perspective, um, you know, when we are comfortable that the different safeguards and identity um, checks and cross matches uh, can be put into the application to prevent fraudsters from beating the system uh, is when we'll look to put it back online. Uh, as I've said from the beginning, I think the hardest part, though, is um, a lot of these fraudsters have a lot of different data points on people. So even the best systems can be fooled um, when you have all the credentials of of an actual human being. So uh, again, we'll, we're still working through it and we're adding some additional features to our application. Um, but again, we also don't want to make it so hard with so many um, uh, multi-factor authentication and other measures that make it impossible for people to actually apply or so difficult they don't want to apply. So right now, the safest option and the easiest option for people is simply to call our call center uh, and submit an application, and they've been doing so uh, since we took it offline. Any idea... Uh what, how many, how much money has been lost just here in Vermont? I know the federal government is, is getting hammered on this, but any, any idea what the, what the cost of Vermont has been or when you might have that number? Yeah, so again, when you say like cost of Vermont, I think that's hard because we're in most cases talking uh, predominantly about federal funds. There are some initial funds that come out of the trust fund. Um, so certainly we're, we're wanting to be very mindful of those. The problem is our, the system, you know, certainly identifies overpayments and we can put people in overpayments. We can stop claims for fraud and look individually to see what's been paid out. But the system as a whole um, does not aggregate overpayments and does not aggregate overpayments that are related to fraud. It's just not a piece of functionality that's in the system. Um, but again, part of the issue, too, is it really all depends on when we catch the fraud, um, how do you monetize fraud that was stopped. Um, but if I had to guess, uh, again, and this is purely a guess just based on volume and what I'm seeing from other states, you know, we're, we're probably in the hundreds of thousands. I'm sure um, by the end, um, you know, probably over a million. Uh, but again, I, that's really just based on, on a guess of, of what we see for volume, what we're seeing other states. And we have, Vermont has actually fared uh, much better than most states um, because of our size. Uh, so we're actually able to review uh, each claim in person and have someone put eyes on each initial claim. Not Most states don't have the ability to do that given the volume. Um, so we've, we've definitely fared much better, but certainly it's out there and we know, um, you know, as we're catching it, what, what has potentially gone out the door. It looks like the UI Trust Fund is, is being replenished um, quite nicely. Is, is that because you're catching the fraud or because the economy is bouncing back, would you say? Yeah, so there are two parts to the trust fund. Uh, you know, obviously um, what people, employers are paying into the fund and what's going out in payments. So you'll see on, on recent reports of trust fund balances that there's been a, an increase um, over the past few weeks to the trust fund. That's predominantly related to the fact that employers um, contribute on a quarterly basis, and we just wrapped up the first quarter of the calendar year, which is also okay. our highest contrib contribution quarter because employers pay uh, taxes on the first um, $14,000 in wages per employee. So again, it just ends up being uh, more of a seasonal uh, aspect to not necessarily an indication of any, any one thing. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Absolutely.
Lisa, the AP. Thanks. Um, I, this is a question for Dr. Levine or uh, Secretary Smith. I'm wondering how many vaccine doses Vermont is requesting this week um, and how that compares to the previous week. Yes, we, we have those numbers for you. Hang on one second. Lisa, it'll all depend on our allocation, and we don't get our allocation until sometime today. The governor will have some information when he comes on our allocation, allocation for this week. But we are requesting additional um, uh, allocation from the pool. And remember, there's a federal pool now where if they have extra, that you can request allocation from that. We are requesting um, 2,340 uh, first doses of Pfizer from that pool. We're also um, requesting a thousand of Johnson and Johnson from that pool. Um, we'll know more about our allocation uh, in a little while in terms of what our weekly allocation our our consistent and and um, regular allocation is of uh, moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson and Johnson. But above and beyond that, that's what we're ordering right now from the pool. Okay, and how does that compare to previous week? Last week, we uh, we couldn't order Johnson and Johnson. Um, uh, previous week, we ordered uh, four. Uh, roughly around 4,000 of Pfizer uh, for the expanding group of 12 to 15. So, and that's from the pool again. We, we took all our allocation from our regular allocation as we have in weeks. I will say this, um, we are going to probably start um, uh, uh, reducing our size of allocation uh, of Moderna at some point, primarily because not of efficacy reasons, it's highly effective and highly um, uh, desirable, but it doesn't have the range of groups that we can use it on. For example, we can't use it on 12 to 15, we can't use it on 15 to 18. Um, so it, it, it's a range of what we can use Moderna on is shrinking as we get more and more Vermonters vaccinated. Plus, we are moving away, as I said, from those high capacity uh, vaccination sites to more bringing vaccine to people. And, um, and as you know, Johnson & Johnson is a, is a viable alternative for that sort of uh, um, one day, one shot and done uh, sort of alternative. So that's where we are right now. I would, I would say that uh, you'll probably see us um, start to reduce our Moderna allocation, request more of our we more than our weekly allocation from the federal uh, federal pool in Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson, and I think that will continue. Okay, thanks. And then you um, you mentioned earlier that I think nine thousand. Uh, um, people 12 to 18 years old have made appointments. Do you know what percent of the population that is? Yeah, that's 9,000 of the 12 to 15 year olds have made appointments. It's, we have 27,000 that we're estimating in that age group. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, uh, Jason. Um, I may have one question for Governor Scott, but I also have one for Dr. Levine. Well, the governor just uh, walked doctor. in the room and said, you wanna, if you want to wait, um, you can give his remarks right now, and then we can come right back to you. Okay. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I just got off the phone with uh, fellow governors, uh, CDC director, Dr. Walensky, White House officials and others, and here's what we heard. Dr. Walensky talked a lot about the confidence in vaccines. She said, and I quote, there's an overwhelming amount of data that shows how effective they are. 
and that's why fully vaccinated people can safely participate in activities without masking. She made clear this was a decision driven by the science, and this is real world data on effectiveness, including against variants here in the US. She also reiterated the data shows vaccinated people are highly protected and are far less likely to spread the virus. We also heard our latest allocations uh, for next week, which is the same as we received last week with no increase or decrease and no J&J. &J. But we can and will request more from the federal pool again, which will include a request for 1,000 doses of J&J. &J. Next, as Secretary Smith discussed, this is EMS week. We've relied on our EMS professionals and volunteers across the state to lead the country in vaccinations. Their commitment to our communities and willingness to serve embody the best of Vermont. And I, and I join all Vermonters in extending my appreciation for their many contributions. And they continue to go above and beyond as they run vaccination clinics all across Vermont. So one of the best ways you can thank them is to get your vaccine. Now I know uh, most are still adjusting to the changes we made to our masking and distancing requirements for vaccinated Vermonters on Friday, which followed guidance from the CDC. And I want to remind everyone, it's okay. Just like it took some time to get used to wearing masks after asking Vermonters to do so over a year ago, it's natural that for some, the adjustment back to normal won't happen overnight. But just remember, the science-based CDC guidance was issued for the entire country. Whether you're the lowest vaccinated state or the highest, like us here in Vermont. Because as they said, not only are you at very little risk of getting COVID if fully vaccinated, you have a low risk of spreading it as well. In fact, over the weekend, Dr. Fauci said, even in the unlikely event that you still, uh, that you test positive after being vaccinated, it's still unlikely you transmit it to someone else. My point is because of our vaccination rate and other factors, no state in the country is in a better and safer position than Vermont to begin transitioning back to normal. In fact, if Vermont was its own country, we'd have one of the highest vaccination rates in the entire world. But we, we can and need to do better, and we're going to do everything, uh, continue to do everything we can to make it as easy and convenient as possible for people to get their shots. Dr. Levine said on Friday, if you haven't been vaccinated yet, we've got your dose waiting for you. And if you need just one more reason to get your vaccine, tomorrow marks the 14th month since our first loss to COVID. So as we do on the 19th of every month, flags will fly at half staff to honor the 254 Vermonters who we've lost during the pandemic. And I'm sure they wish they had the opportunity you have today to get vaccinated and protect yourself. So with that, we'll get back to your questions. And we'll go back to Mike, because we cut him off, and then we'll go, just so everyone on the queue knows, we'll go back to Calvin and Stewart, and then Ham, and then we'll continue the normal queue. So Mike, you might have to hit star six again, because I think I may need you. Oh, you're good now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first, uh, I'll, I'll go with Dr. Levine. Uh, Dr. Uh, can we get an update on the uh, AstraZeneca study in Vermont? Um, the shots have not been approved yet. I believe there's like 300 Vermonters were part of the experiment out of something like 3,000 people applying. And I spoke to one of the Vermonters in the trial experiment who got her two shots in December. But I think there's still a cloud over everything as to, since it hasn't been approved in Vermont or really the United States, has been in other countries. What's the message to these Vermonters that were part of that experiment? To, what can you tell them today? And, and should they go get one of the approved vaccines 
or should should they get the experiment? I mean, is there? I assume health is still paramount in these cases. And just wondering what you can tell these Vermonters. Thank you. Uh, first, thank I want first I want to tell them thank you uh, because of the fact that they chose to volunteer for an early vaccine trial and enhance our knowledge about vaccine performance, both efficacy and safety. Um, second, I want to inform them that, um, as they probably are aware, they can communicate with those who ran the trial at the University of Vermont um, if they have any specific questions. Uh, third, we have worked very closely with those investigators, and they are representative of investigators all around the country because, indeed, Vermont wasn't the only site. It was one of the sites. And we've been of the opinion that if they got full vaccination with AstraZeneca, there is no need for them to seek another vaccine. Doesn't mean they can't if they don't want to, but at the same time, uh, I don't believe that the investigators in the study are recommending to them specifically uh, to get a vaccine if they were in the vaccine arm of the study. Um, it is uh, concerning, of course, because the, the full um, EUA process hasn't been gone through yet in the United States, uh, though this vaccine has been approved in numerous uh, other countries in the world. So people are confident in its ability to protect them. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. But they should work closely with the study investigators who enrolled them in the first place uh, for any specific questions they have. Thank you. Uh, and Governor, um, Vermont has had a, a third fatal crash here involving a young teen driver in recent months. And uh, state police still continue to hide the names of, of these teen drivers and passengers killed and everything. S-107, which would increase the age of youthful offenders up to age 20 and protect them from having their names released, um, even though the names are in the obituary, the death certificates are public, and names are spray painted on the road at the crash sites of these dead people. I'm just wondering if you've got any thoughts. Uh, S-107 bill has reached your desk and you've got to sign it or veto it or do something. Do you have any initial thoughts on that bill yet? Yeah, I inquired about that bill uh, this morning. I don't, uh, I haven't looked at it myself. I know we received it and I believe that I have until Thursday uh, to make a decision. Um, unfortunately, I, I'd hoped that they would have cleared that up and we go back uh, to the way that we had um, previously uh, been transparent with the media on, on this, but, uh, but it appears they might have gone in the other direction. So. Uh, all I can say is I'm going to take a look at it. I haven't uh, I haven't reflected on it, and I haven't uh, counseled with uh, anyone else um, in the cabinet yet either. So, we'll uh, time will tell. You'll know by Friday, though. Okay. I mean, there is one provision in there that is interesting. That it basically it leaves it up to every police department to decide whether they're going to give out names or not. So, as was pointed out in the debate in the House. The Montpelier Police Department could give out names and Northfield PD could not give out the names or any two neighboring departments could all be in contrast. Uh, so it seems like this is a recipe for disaster for inconsistency. Yeah, I am aware as well that the VPA has uh, requested that I veto it. Um, I did take a quick look to see and it um, appears to have had um, overwhelming support in the, at least in the House. Uh, and I'm not sure about the Senate. I don't think there was a. I think it was a voice vote in the uh, in the Senate. But again, I'll reflect on that and try and make a decision. Thank you very much, Calvin WCX. Um, 
Thank you very much, Governor. So, you know, you, you kind of touched upon it in your, your opening remarks, but, you know, we've seen a number of uh, many businesses and, and some municipalities that are choosing to keep the mask mandate in, in effect. So I guess, you know, I, I'm just wondering, you know, what, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, are people not trusting the science or are people just hesitant? I mean, what, what, is, what, what are you seeing here? Yeah, you, you know, it's, uh, it is interesting. And, and I remember how difficult it was for people to mask up uh, when we did this a year ago. Um, so I'm not surprised that it takes a little time. It, gets, it takes a little time to get used to uh, this new environment. I, I just want to remind everyone, first of all, we still have a masking policy. Um, so if you're unvaccinated, if you're not fully vaccinated, you still uh, have to wear a mask. So that's still in place. Uh, we have allowed uh, municipalities uh, to determine on their own uh, whether they want to uh, continue or do whatever they want to um, with this uh, with this policy, uh, and uh, and we've allowed uh, businesses as well uh, to make these decisions. You know, I think it's it's interesting because I've heard a lot about uh, we've followed the science and the data uh, from day one, and it's served us well here in Vermont. Um, being the lowest in the country on many different fronts. Uh, so we decided to continue. It hit us by surprise, admittedly. I said that on, uh, on, uh, on Friday. Uh, but, um, but this is what they determined was the best approach from the CDC. And uh, the healthcare experts and the scientists said it's safe. Um, so we're going to continue to follow uh, their guidance. And, and, it, and it, in reflection, um, it seems as though most most people, most everyone uh, across Vermont has has uh, believed in the science uh, until it conflicts with their fear or the ideology or their politics, and then they don't believe the science. But uh, we, uh, our team, is going to continue uh, to believe in the science and the data. And then I guess my second question might be for Secretary Smith. Um, in Commissioner Pichak's slides, it, it appeared that uh, the number of people who are signing up or seeking out the vaccine has kind of dipped down a little bit. I'm wondering if um, you know, either the state uh, is, is seeing any wastage or spoilage of doses, either uh, at state clinics or at federal pharmacy partners as well. Calvin, I haven't I haven't heard of a tremendous amount of dosage that um, is, um, as you say, wasted. Um, we do, you know, we will do, we will use um, vaccine in other clinics because we can uh, at various times. But if you think through the question a little bit, there's only it's only natural that some will start occurring because. You may have two people left, for example, at a walk-in clinic, and you have to open up another vial uh, in order to do that. So, you know, if you think through that, um, there is some logic to the question that we will see an increase in our wasted doses. But at the same time, um, it's imperative that we get more Vermonters uh, vaccinated. You know, we are number one in the nation. We shouldn't be happy with that. We should continue to strive to get as many um, va people vaccinated as possible. And as you bring the vaccine to people, um, you don't know what, who's going to show up and who isn't going to show up. So I think, you know, it, it, we are going to have to prepare ourselves for some wasted. But I, I just want to dispel the notion that, you know, if, um, if you prepare for 140 show up, that doesn't mean that there's 60 w w wasted vials or dosages of it. it means we can use it someplace else which we do um, it's when you open the vial um, is the situation that you have to be careful about thank you sorry uh Good morning. A uh, question about the Canadian border. Uh, again, I probably imagine that you would have mentioned something, but do you expect that the border uh, shutdown will be extended? It's due to expire Friday, as you know. And what um, what does that mean for us for the summer tourism economy ahead? Um, 
you know, interestingly enough, uh, yesterday I had um, a conference with New England governors and the Eastern premiers. Uh, we spoke uh, about the border. Uh, I think all of us um, were joined together in advocating for when it's safe uh, to open up the border. Now, Canada is a little bit uh, behind us uh, in, in terms of uh, the vaccination rate, uh, but they're starting to catch up. Although uh, a couple of the premiers I, we spoke with uh, had said that they're having uh, difficulty getting the vaccine. Um, so we'll just have to, I expect uh, that it will be uh, continued. The border will be closed again, probably for extended for another month, but I don't have any inside knowledge of that just based on what I heard from them. And again, uh, I wanna reiterate uh, that they're, I believe they're still closed uh, between uh, uh, provinces as well. Uh, I will note, uh, we were all somewhat, uh, we were talking about uh, our, our own experiences within our states uh, and uh, how well the Northeast is doing in general, and we were giving statistics uh, per state. Uh, and then uh, when the, the uh, uh, premier of uh, Prince Edward Island uh, told us about their experience, they have uh, fewer than 200 cases and zero deaths. Uh, so they've done extremely well, uh, but they're having difficulty in opening back up uh, because they haven't received uh, the vaccine. So they're hesitant to open up their border uh, to allow, they've done so well over the last 14 months, uh, to allow uh, tourism back into uh, to their province. So uh, this is, a, I think we have all have a common interest. We all wanna see the border open back up uh, but this won't be forced, and uh, it will be in uh, when both sides, uh, the U.S. and Canada, can agree that it's safe to do so. What does that mean, though, for our summer tourism economy? Well, I, I still believe that uh, before uh, the summer is over, uh, that uh, that it will be opened back up, uh, and I'm I'm hopeful uh, that it'll be by midsummer, but again, I have no inside knowledge as to, uh, to, to when that will be. Um, it will be difficult, especially for the northern parts, part of the state. Um, but as we saw last year, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the, I think there's uh, pent up demand. People from other parts of uh, the US will wanna come to Vermont. So I, I believe tourism uh, will do well uh, in Vermont. We're going to be We've advocated for more tourism dollars uh, to, uh, to be able to, uh, to advertise uh, the fact that we're open, ready for business, and uh, we'll do all we can to make sure all the businesses are prepared. So I still believe we'll have a decent year, but it'll be a spectacular year if, uh, if the border is open back up before the end of the summer. Let me ask you about the um, what seems like the final week of the session. Uh, uh, the budget conferees seemed very close last night, and they want to keep the $150 million payment uh, to, you know, make a dent in the pension underfunding problem. Um, as you know, they push benefit changes off until next year. Is that is that grounds for a budget veto? Um, are there other lines in the sand? I know you've been yeah. talking with leadership. Uh, now, we've been working together, and uh, I've been speaking to uh, leadership myself uh, about that very provision. I I'm not opposed to having a reserve, uh, the $150 million reserve for uh, the pension um, to buy down uh, the, the pensions is fine, uh, but it has to come with structural changes. Uh, and that's what's something that will happen next year. But if they want to reserve that, um, I have uh, had advocated that it come out of uh, the surplus money for this year, uh, but they want to build it into uh, to the base, uh, into the general fund. Um, again, any, I, I believe there's enough money to go around uh, so that we can all be satisfied. Uh, I have concerns uh, about some of the ARPA funding, but uh, we are making great progress in that regard. And uh, if we continue uh, to make the progress that we've been seeing, over the last uh, two or three days, last week, um, then we might have something that uh, that I could accept. But time will tell. A lot can happen in the next uh, 24 hours. 
Thanks very much. Pam Davis of Vermont Journal. Uh, this Governor, this is, a, this is a question for Governor Scott. Uh, there's been a, quite some stuff and in some information in the press recently about um, Republicans, uh, non-Trump Republicans across the United States, but mostly in, you know, formally strong uh, political positions who have, have uh, talked about starting a, uh, a third party uh, if the uh, if the Republican Party, if the current Republican Party, continues to, to follow so closely along with Donald Trump. I'm curious what you think of that. What do you think of that idea? You've been one of the, most, the strongest, most vociferous, well, maybe vociferous is strong, but the strongest uh, anti-Trump governors in the United States. So I'm curious whether you think about this. Would you be interested in it? Do you think it's a good idea? Well, I would much rather uh, see the uh, those who are disenfranchised, uh, myself included, and many other. Uh, I would say there's a few other governors uh, throughout the country and and leaders uh, to advocate and and continue to stand up against what I see as uh, as problematic uh, for the party and uh, to again try to uh, agree on the principles that brought us to the party to begin with and advocate, continue to advocate for them. I, I believe um, that would make the party stronger, um, but, um, but again, we'll have to see how far this ideology goes. Um, and, and I've said it before, um, the litmus test of uh, being a supporter of the former president um, is uh, you know, a bit of a non-starter from my perspective. But having said that, I've never been asked uh, from the Republican Governors Association uh, about uh, my allegiance or lack of allegiance uh, to the former president. That just has not been an issue, and it has not been an issue uh, with my fellow Republican governors. So I still have hope uh, that we can pull this together. Thank you. Derek, seven days. Hi there. Uh, first, following up on the uh, question about municipalities and mask mandates, uh, Governor, I'm wondering if uh, it's your position that municipalities should continue to have this authority to enact uh, mask mandates as they see fit uh, indefinitely, or if uh, you think that, uh, or if you think that authority will end either when you rescind your executive order or otherwise. Well, if I would have to look at that uh, technically and legally, I think I don't. I believe it will end as soon as the. Uh, emergency order is lifted and we remove that provision uh, from the emergency order but I'll have to check with our general counsel on that to be sure uh, but that would be my um, my choice my prerogative okay and then uh, we obviously have moved to step three of the Vermont forward plan earlier than initially anticipated if this current pace continues uh, will will you be moving to the final step ahead of that yeah uh, I'm July 4th date it, uh, it all really depends. Everything that we've done, all our steps uh, have uh, been reliant on our vaccination rate. And if we can continue to get more uh, vaccines in the arms of Vermonters, then uh, we, can, we can see a time uh, when we will move that date up. So uh, regardless, I, I believe it's still the 4th of July. Uh, so in a matter of uh, five to six weeks, uh, all of the restrictions will be lifted. Uh, but we can make um, significant progress in vaccination, even though we're the, um, we, we lead the country in vaccinations, we shouldn't rest on our laurels. We should continue to advocate and to protect yourself and to protect others uh, in, the, in the fall and the winter uh, when, this, uh, when the coronavirus comes back, because it, it's not going to leave us. Uh, we're going to have to deal with this in, in years to come. So uh, this will just put us in a much stronger position than any other state, as far as I'm concerned. If I could just follow up on that, the, 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 that last step on July 4th doesn't have a, a vaccination, a, or a vaccination um, 
rate band attached to it. There isn't a metric attached to that. Uh, is there something in your mind, a sort of a threshold that you would like to see crossed before we take that final step? Y yes, uh, there is. And, uh, and we've been talking about that with the team and, and hopefully uh, I'll be able to uh, publicly talk about that um, by next week, by Tuesday, and uh, let you know what I think our goal should be. I, I've had one in mind uh, ever since we developed uh, the Vermont Forward Plan, and uh, but I would like to communicate that with uh, with Vermonters so we know what we're striving for, which I think will be achievable. Great. Thank you. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, I see that yesterday was the deadline for the first round of uh, submissions to RFPs from uh, uh, communications union districts uh, regarding getting funding for expansion of broadband in those communities that have CUD uh, and the second round coming up. The uh, question I have for you is, has the legislature or the uh, Department of Public Services done anything in terms of a grand master plan that goes beyond uh, this portion of attending to the needs of the CUDs? Well, that's uh, part of uh, the struggle. Uh, I think we're all experiencing uh, the legislature, the House and the Senate have uh, separate different views on that. I think they're coming to some resolution on that. We have our views as well, and we'll just have to see where we end up. I've been focusing uh, the last uh, week or so on making sure that we have uh, enough money uh, set aside to put into the ARPA funding. Uh, so that we can make a dent in uh, our broadband um, situation. So um, I'm still hopeful uh, that we'll have a broader perspective, a uh, broader plan from the legislature built into the budget uh, that will show the intent of uh, what buckets uh, we put the ARPA funding into. Um, and I'm, again, um, I, I'm... I'm from what I've seen over the last week, we've made uh, significant strides in that regard as well. And it seems as though the legislature will um, be putting intent language in the bill uh, to, uh, to, so that we know where we're going to uh, spend this money in the future. It seems that communities would really like to know uh, whether or not of course, A, if there's going to be enough funding, and B, where they sit on the list of when they might see uh, some activity. This this first round it says that the money is to be implemented between May 17th and July 15th. Um, is, is there any way, just like you put together with your administration plan to manage COVID all the way through, that, uh, that the legislature could, uh, you know, be impressed upon the importance of having a bigger vision that the, the entire uh, communities of the state could could see and understand. Yeah, I think you uh, you hit the nail on the head. I think that the, we need a plan. That's what I've been asking for. I've I've uh, communicated my vision, uh, and I think it's time for the legislature to advocate for their vision. Uh, again, we all agree that we want to um, to uh, to put resources into broadband. It's just, just a question of how much, and I'm hoping that we will commit to at least the 250 million, uh, even though uh, there is talk in Washington uh, that there could be more money. But let's deal with what we know today and uh, to make sure that we put uh, some parameters around the money we have today. And uh, then we can deal with if, if there's another bill and there's more money, we can we can shift things around uh, accordingly after the fact, but uh, but I think it's uh, it's tremendously important for us to to be able to communicate to Vermonters what we're going to do uh, with this money. Uh, so it's it's transparent, transformative, uh, and uh, and will transition the state uh, in the in the future. So, uh, but I'm still again I'm hopeful, and and I've we've seen great progress uh, with the conferees uh, to put this intent language in the bill so that we uh, can see uh, where we're going to go in the future. Okay. I appreciate your time. Have a good day.
Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Thank you, Jason. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, to pick up where a couple questions ago, uh, we're about six weeks away from July 4th. That happens to be the same amount of time it takes for the Moderna vaccine to get both doses, to get your two weeks. Uh, it also means we're only about a week left to get Pfizer in order to, uh, to meet our, our July 4th goal of being fully vaccinated at a, at a certain level. Uh, and it doesn't sound like we're really getting all that many Johnson & Johnson vaccines, which would be kind of that last, uh, last ditch effort to uh, increase that percentage of fully vaccinated by July 4th. Um, I, I was going to ask, you know, what your metric is. Obviously, you kind of don't, don't want to share that. And it, it seems like maybe it's a, it's a moving metric and we're just trying to see how many we can get. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering um, what sort of incentive is there for people to try to get vaccinated in the next handful of weeks if, you know, other than purely being vaccinated, uh, if, if they're not going to be fully vaccinated by July 4th anyway? Yeah, you know, in my opening remarks, I, I talked about um, the 254 Vermonters will honor tomorrow um, by lowering the flag due to the loss of life uh, due to COVID. Um, I think that should be incentive enough from my standpoint. If you want to protect yourself, there comes a point when it's uh, self-responsibility. You know, we've had close to 400,000 people, uh, Vermonters, uh, having been vaccinated thus far. Um, and it didn't take an incentive uh, to do what was uh, the, uh, to, to do what they'd done. Uh, and that was to do the right thing for themselves and others. So this, uh, this won't end regardless of whether the restrictions are lifted uh, by the 4th of July, which I have said, I believe we will. Um, but Beyond that, we're still going to be vaccinating Vermonters. Um, for those who are sitting on the fence, uh, who can see uh, the benefits of uh, doing so to protect yourself and others, uh, then, uh, then you should do that. Uh, those who are fully vaccinated don't really have anything to worry about. Uh, they don't have to uh, physically distance. Uh, they don't have to wear masks. Uh, they can go into places without worrying. So peace of mind, I think, would lead me uh, to want to get my vaccine. Now, if they want to uh, take, that, um, uh, take that responsibility on themselves, and, and um, that's just something we'll have to, have to live with. Um, we're not going to mandate this. So uh, again, we've done pretty well. When I look at, I think President Biden has set a goal of 70% uh, uh, by the 4th of July, uh, and that's of uh, those 18 and over. Now we've we've already we've already pretty much hit 70% of the whole population, so we'll exceed far exceed his goal. Um, so at that point, it'll be safe for those who've been vaccinated, and uh, I think that the, those who aren't vaccinated will have to deal with that on their own. Thanks. And uh, a quick follow-up. I've been hearing from uh, uh, people who are planning July 4th events. Uh, they want to know, when you say reopening by July 4th, that, that's on a Sunday. Are you thinking, you know, being able to take effect uh, Friday for the July 4th weekend? Or are you, are you kind of hard set on, on, a, on a Sunday yeah. uh, reopening? No, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not set on that. The 4th of July was a target that... Um, I picked out a number of months ago, um, but um, but I would be more than happy if we can hit uh, the target that I uh, have in mind and we can agree on uh, if we could open up a couple of weeks early. Uh, that would be fine with me. That would, that would be uh, a good problem to have. Okay, and uh, lastly, Governor, uh, last week we had a local teacher arrested for sexually assaulting a student um, in the affidavit, there were multiple indicators that at least two school employees may have suspected something go was going on with this teacher and the victim. Um, I'm wondering, is the State Department of Education uh, 
looking into this, investigating it at all on their end, or, or is it purely law enforcement? That's, I, uh, I, have, I have no idea at this point. Uh, I think it's a criminal investigation, and there may be um, a ripple effect or repercussions as a result of the criminal investigation, but I don't know uh, that at this point in time. Uh, possibly uh, Secretary French might know. Uh, Secretary French. Yeah, thank you, Governor. Um, yeah, I won't comment on the specific case, but uh, I agree uh, the governor's observation that often uh, criminal investigations do uh, have a ripple effect in other areas, and certainly the agency uh, will be an agency of education will be a kind of any implications relative to individuals who hold an educator license. That does in just uh, more broadly than I, I know you can't speak specifically on this more broadly, does the Department of Ed typically look into something like this on their own? Well, we would respond often to any kind of media reporting of a situation that we feel might have implications uh, relative to our regulations, so it's not uncommon for us to do so. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Governor. Thank you. Aaron Tanko, VT Digger. Hi. Um, the department said yesterday that it is aware of issues claimants have been having entering work search information or entering exemptions. What is the cause of these issues and when can Vermonters expect them to be resolved? Uh, Commissioner Harrington, are you on? I am, Governor, and uh, happy to answer that. So. Uh, the Department put out some information yesterday um, and shared also with claimants that, you know, we, we became aware on Sunday that there were a couple issues. Part of it is that the way our mainframe and systems are designed, um, work search was a standard practice prior to the pandemic. There's a lot of exemptions and considerations now. So sometimes there's uh, subpopulations in the group that are marked, uh, whether they have a return to work date, where they fall into a specific category. We found that there was a handful of claimants in regular unemployment insurance who um, were not being presented uh, with the work search screen, probably because they fell into one of these um, subcategories in the mainframe and it just wasn't caught in the initial coding. Uh, we did and were aware um, on Sunday. We also were prepared because we knew uh, just maybe based on prior experience that things uh, tend to not always go off without a hitch. Um, so we did have teams on standby uh, both over the weekend and early Monday uh, as we saw some of these issues pop up. So some of them were corrected uh, first thing Monday morning. Uh, I think some others uh, may have been corrected as late as today because they had to process overnight. Uh, we found that there were some people who had come into the PUA program uh, maybe through a side door um, early on in the pandemic. So they didn't complete the full initial application as it was originally presented where they could self-select whether they were an independent contractor or self-employed. So we still process and move them over to PUA, but on their actual base application, that marker wasn't selected because they came in maybe through our call center or maybe through an early form of the application. Um, and so uh, we had set up the system so that independent contractors and self-employed individuals would bypass the work search uh, requirement. Um, but obviously there was this uh, subset of that population as well um, where their application just hadn't been marked early on because they came in through an alternate means. Um, and so we were able to um, correct that as well. So I believe most of the, the issues have been resolved uh, most were done yesterday. Some may linger till today or tomorrow, um, but everybody should be able to still file their weekly claim this week and get paid out. So I don't expect any any long term situation or delay in people receiving their benefits. And, and like I mentioned, this wasn't completely unforeseen. We expected that there may be problems restarting uh, a very complex process like work search where there's a lot of questions and scenarios and circumstances. Um, and we did have teams ready to go just for that specific reason. Are you concerned at all, or is there any evidence that the work search requirements and, you know, just the kind of 
paperwork hassle is going to discourage people from continuing on unemployment benefits, even though they would qualify to receive them? Well, I would point out there that actually the work search is a qualifier for receiving benefits. So this is not necessarily something new to unemployment insurance. We're actually uh, moving back to a more traditional form of unemployment insurance, which does require people to look for work and conduct work searches. We have simply modified the process to allow for COVID specific circumstances um, that uh, would maybe exempt somebody from conducting a work search. Uh, you know, to the work search question, um, it, it is relatively easy. Um, there's not a whole lot of paperwork that it takes. They do have to conduct outreach to employers who are hiring and have job availability. Uh, and they have to submit either a resume or an application or something that shows intent uh, for applying for the job and interest in the job. Uh, and then they simply have to report the contact information they made, the date they made it, who they spoke with, uh, on their weekly application. So again, not a lot of documentation, but it is one more step in the process as we return to a more normal structure for, for unemployment benefits. All right, um, I also have a question, maybe for, for Smith or Levine. Um, you know, we reported today that there are zero active outbreaks in long-term care facilities. Does the state have any plans to kind of loosen uh, rules and restrictions at those facilities even further, uh, whether that's, you know, loosening visitor policy even more or, um, you know, kind of freeing staff from these rounds of testing that, I, from what I understand, is still being conducted? So that's really gratifying data regarding the long-term cares. And uh, we expect that, obviously, to continue, which would be great. Some of the uh, abilities we have are constrained by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. So um, we have to follow them. Uh, it has to do with the um, certification of those facilities. And they have to be in compliance with CMS regulations. So uh, we can only go so far. The good news is. Sometimes the policies are tied to the amount of virus activity in a specific area. And our case counts continue to go down. So when you look at the metrics, whether it be percent of new cases in a given time frame or percent positivity, those will look very favorable so that the facilities will be able to take advantage of the most, if you will, relaxed of those guidelines. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Kat, WCAX. Hi. I have had a few viewers who are fully vaccinated and immunocompromised reach out to me and ask if they should consider trying to get tested for antibody levels to make sure that their vaccine worked for them. I guess they're concerned that their body may have not been able to mount a strong immune response but they would like to ease up on some of the restrictions that they've put on their own lives, uh, like masking, considering they are fully vaccinated. So is that something they should consider getting or something they even can get to get some peace of mind? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, that has been a subject of discussion both nationally and within the state. Uh, as you know, from time to time, I have uh, convened a special test work group that I have uh, within the Department of Health and the University of Vermont, uh, spanning uh, the medical community, the public health community, the laboratory community, and we are evaluating these all the time. This was the topic of our discussion two Fridays ago, uh, because we've received some of the same uh, requests that uh, you received from your viewer. The bottom line is I would like them to stay tuned and be patient but don't think that their patience has to run for the next 12 months. We expect certainly before the end of the year and hopefully much sooner, there will be testing that's more quantitative and specific to the question they're asking, which is how good has the vaccine been for them and their immune response? Right now, there are more qualitative tests, which um, really aren't going to be good enough to answer their question with assuredness. And I wouldn't want them to just get a test result saying, 
yes, antibodies were found, uh, making them feel comfortable, but not actually knowing for real if they have as good a response as possible. So we expect that sometime over the next several months, uh, certainly not beyond the year, uh, that we'll have testing that would be appropriate to the question they've asked. So I, I know that's challenging for them um, uh, because it certainly can't allow their behaviors to try to uh, be predictable in a way uh, based on their body's immune response, but that, that is the state of where we are now. Is this something that you would consider enlisting the UVM Lerner College of Medicine's help on? I know when I spoke with them last year, I believe researchers there had been able to test for specific antibody levels, not just whether someone had them or didn't have them, but the actual level that they had them at. Yeah, no, part of my group, um, a significant part of it is from the UVM Lerner College of Medicine, both uh, the Division of Infectious Diseases and the Department of uh, Laboratory Medicine in the, uh, in the Pathology Department. So people who are actually uh, dealing with these questions all the time from patients and people who are dealing with the actual test platforms that the college and its medical center uh, apply to this concept. So they're all involved already. Um, all that needs to be done is um, have a commercially available test that has the reliability and validity that's required to answer the questions you've asked. Just to confirm for people who are listening, so the quantitative versus qualitative is that thing that I brought up where it's how many antibodies you have versus whether you have them or don't have them. Yes, and the strength of the antibody response. Not just having the Got antibody, but having a strong response. Howard Weiss Tisman, VPR. This is for the governor. I know that uh, you've been asked a few questions about the July 4th date, and um, we're going to be hearing more about that. But I'm still unclear what has prevented you from um, setting that benchmark. What, what, you know, didn't we know, or are we learning, or what are the discussions going on um, to help you make that decision, and why wasn't that included in the original Vermont Forward Plan? Um. Well, we had uh, set the, the benchmarks, the ranges in terms of when we go to the next level uh, and then where we thought we would be at the end, but we didn't set that uh, benchmark. Um, from my standpoint, it might have been just a bit of an oversight on my part, uh, not, uh, not seeing that. Uh, I just assumed uh, that we would be at a certain level. Um, so we're, um, we're still um, contemplating that uh, right now. We're just focusing on trying to get uh, more vaccinations uh, performed. And uh, we're looking at the age categories. I'm still concerned about the 18 to 29 year olds. Um, that was, uh, as you remember, uh, that was April 19th, I believe, uh, that we uh, opened up that age group. And we're only at about, I think, 50% at this point in time. And as you know, if you, if you look at it as compared to the other age groups, we opened up the 16 to 17 year olds uh, just uh, two days before and, uh, and we're at 60% with them. Um, in the 12 to 15 year olds, uh, we had over 7,000 in the first day. So I know that's dropped off uh, since then, but, uh, but again, it was an encouraging sign and we're hoping these, uh, these lower age groups will uh, increase uh, as time goes on. So that's what we're focusing on, trying to use different strategies, making sure that we uh, get to everyone that is willing and wants to be vaccinated, uh, the opportunity to do so. But I, I believe we're at that point now. Now we're just having to seek them out and make it as easy uh, as, as, as possible. Right, but that still doesn't make sense to me as why you wanted, it seems like if we were trying to encourage these folks, we would have that number on the July 4th and say, hey, if you want to open up, we need 80 or 85% of all of you. And um, it just doesn't add up. I don't understand why you wouldn't have set that 
goal um, back when you issued the plan or even, you know, last week or today? Yeah. Well, again, um, we are contemplating that as we speak. I think you can expect to, to see the goal in the next uh, in the next week. Hmm. All right. Um, here's a question for Secretary Smith. Um, UVM Health Network yesterday put out a press release and said that they were profitable in the most recent quarter, uh, but that was largely due to the state and federal assistance they received. And I'm just wondering, what can you say um, about Vermont's hospital system? I mean, before COVID, about half of the hospitals were losing money. Um, do you have concerns? What, what can you share with us as far as how you're hoping things look moving forward as far as profitability in the hospital system? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to still monitor how that looks, Howard. I, you know, obviously our main focus was when we shut down the healthcare system in terms of, uh, uh, you know, elective surgeries and other things um, that we really didn't want the healthcare system to fail. So we invest a lot of money into the healthcare system, as you just you just talked about. Now it's time to see how the healthcare system is faring as we come out of this. Uh, out of the pandemic and how we look at it as we move forward. I don't think I've come to any conclusions yet in terms of where they are and how they're doing. It does have to sugar out. The federal and state money does have to sugar out and they do have to, uh, we do have to see how they're moving forward on this. I would say stay tuned. We're watching it. Uh, we understand, you know, that this may, you know, the, the aspect of UVM MC Having or the healthcare network having a um, having a good quarter based upon federal and state money is not it's not necessarily good news. Um, we really have got to see how they do on standing on their own. And I think it's a little too early to tell right at the moment. Are you concerned that there's not another big pot of money out there to bail out um, organizations? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, uh, I don't know if the word is concerned that there's not another pot of money. I'm concerned to make sure that they are fiscally um, stable as they move forward. There's a ver variety of ways to do that other than a, pot, a big pot of money to, uh, to, um, to stabilize that. I don't think you can um, continue on an ongoing basis to have a stabilization fund that keeps um, providing money along the way on a, on a, uh, in a longevity sort of way uh, on a, a longer basis because it's just that's not sustainable either. So we just got to look at making sure that hospitals are sustainable on their own right without federal or, uh, or state money. All right. Thank you both. Thanks. Kevin Bates, Local 22, Local 44. Bates. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Oh, sorry about that. Yes, question for Governor Scott. The Senate passed S-15, the universal mail-in voting bill for general elections. Um, I know you've spoken in support of this in the past, but just wondering if this is a bill that you will be signing and how important of a move it is for Vermont, given a time when other states are taking steps to restrict voting access. Well, again, um, I have said that I supported this uh, measure. We'll uh, see what the bill actually says. I haven't, I haven't read it myself at this point after it passed, um, but I have no, uh, no doubt uh, that if it, everything is uh, correct, uh, that, uh, that I'll be signing it. Uh, in terms of you know, how that compares to other states, every state has to do uh, what they think is right for them. Uh, I think we proved uh, in the last election uh, that uh, that this was worthwhile. I think it uh, actually uh, benefited uh, everyone in some respects, uh, and certainly uh, Republicans. Uh, I think there were more elected last, uh, last general election than the one before. So I think that uh, getting more people out to vote, making it as easy as possible for them to do so, uh, to exercise this right, was uh, 
was something that was beneficial to Vermont. But I can't speak to why other states are doing what they do, but, um, but I feel secure with what we're doing in Vermont. I would like to see it expanded uh, to other areas, local elections. I mean, we, we talk a lot about uh, getting more participation in voting, um, but uh, we seem to be focused on just the general election, um, which is typically uh, where we have the most participation. I'm as concerned about some of the local elections uh, that, uh, that have, are struggling uh, to get enough voters to the ballot box. So I hope uh, they continue to move in this direction uh, with local elections as well. And then just a quick question as well. I, I've seen that 11 states have uh, made it permanent that, um, you know, the, the to-go alcoholic beverages that we saw instituted at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, they're permanent in a lot of states, Florida and Georgia, I saw. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Is that something that should be made permanent in Vermont? We've been advocating, or my administration uh, has been advocating for making this uh, an ongoing effort and continuing uh, with that to-go uh, structure. But, um, but I'm not sure the legislature totally agrees. So we'll see what they do. It's a measure that's being considered at this point in time. And I don't know where we're at with that, but it's uh, embedded in one of the, one of the uh, liquor lottery bills. All right, thank you, Governor. Joseph Gresser, Martin Chronicle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not as bad as mine. Oh. Hello, Governor. Um, I have a question from a reader who works for the state. Um, her job is an outside job where she um, is never closer than six feet from any of the people she's working with. And she is curious as to whether she and her coworkers will be required to continue to wear masks indefinitely. Um, we are you know, contemplating all those questions as we speak. Um, certainly uh, when the restrictions are lifted after the 4th of July or, or before, um, this will just be guidance uh, on our part. Now, I know this is a state employee, uh, so that we'll have, uh, we'll have guidance as well for them, but, uh, but I don't believe there's anything in place at this point in time. Um, maybe S if Secretary Young is on, uh, maybe she could uh, tell us where we're at with that, but, um, but again, I know we're, we're considering. have uh, nothing formal in place at this point in time uh, in terms of additional guidance. Uh, we put out yesterday that, effective yesterday, um, the state would be uh, applying for universal guidance, which uh, again means um, wearing a mask if you're not vaccinated, um, distancing if you're not vaccinated, uh, and of course the, the hygiene requirement. Hey, Joe, is this person vaccinated or not? Vaccinated. So, I mean, I, I would, again, we'll, uh, we'll be contemplating this, but, uh, but I see no reason why anyone would have to wear a mask if they're vaccinated. Well, thank you very much. Avery Powell, WCAX. Governor, I asked you a few weeks ago about curfew restrictions on bars and restaurants. I'm wondering if you've given any more thought to setting a deadline for when those will be loosened and thought maybe that could be an incentive for younger people to get the vaccine. Yeah, well, I'm hoping that it's still an incentive um, because we're still watching that 18 to 29 uh, age grouping. Um, that's at, uh, as I said, is about 50 percent right now. We'd like to see that higher and get to where we are with other age groups as well uh, before we open up uh, the bars, restaurants, and uh, social clubs. So um, we're still contemplating this. Um, again, it suffices to say that uh, by the 4th of July or before, when we lift all restrictions, uh, this won't be an issue. But, uh, uh, but we'd like to open up uh, the, you know, uh, 
remove the restriction on hours as soon as possible. But I'd like to see the numbers increase on the 18 to 29 category before we do so. Thank you. Guy Page, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Uh, Governor, uh, state line reports that nationwide police departments uh, are victims of cyber attacks where the crooks threaten to release vital information unless the police pay up. Um, has that happened that we know of in Vermont? Have we had any cyber attacks on Vermont law enforcement? Um, I don't know. I think you're referring to what's termed ransomware, and uh, I'm not familiar uh, with whether any have been or not. I know uh, if you uh, were to talk with our Secretary of ADS, uh, John Quinn, he would tell you that we're constantly under attack. Uh, that's why we have put protections in place. And uh, and my myself would, uh, would say that uh, anyone who has been attacked and has been hacked, uh, that they not uh, give in to those um, ransomware types of provisions because that only encourages uh, people to continue uh, to use this method uh, to, to acquire money. So um, I don't know. Um, I could ask our uh, agency of digital services if he's aware, but I don't know at this point in time whether any of our law enforcement uh, uh, friends have uh, have seen any of this in their in their communities. Okay, um, thank you. Um, also, uh, in July, if I understand correctly, the voucher program for hotels for the homeless ends. Uh, do we know what will be taking its place, and how will uh, what will the homeless uh, what will their options be? Um, I'll let Secretary, Secretary Smith answer that, but, uh, but again, that's part of uh, what we've been trying to advocate for over the last uh, week or two. Uh, you know, in the ARPA funding, we had put a significant amount of money, $250 million, uh, towards uh, towards uh, housing, and uh, a major piece of that, uh, at least uh, $100 million, was for the homeless population to put them in permanent housing so that we didn't have to use general fund dollars in the future. Uh, over the last uh, 14 months or so, we've spent uh, upwards to over $70 million uh, for uh, for this reason alone. So, And that's uh, through FEMA. We were able to utilize that, but we're not going to have FEMA in the future um, to, to satisfy the need and demand that's out there. So the answer is permanent housing, and that's why we're fighting so hard uh, to keep um, keep that money in the uh, housing bucket for ARPA. Secretary Smith. Guy, that's a timely question because we are um, in the legislature right now and the legislature has been working with us as well as housing advocates to um, uh, how do we sort of wind down a program that's unsustainable, as the governor said, we're on a trajectory this year to spend about $78 million, a lot of it's FEMA money, but we were on a trajectory, if we continue this program, to spend $106 million um, a year. So what do we do? Um, the, the, the issue that we were talking about is exactly what the governor had said. We need permanent housing. In the governor's recommend on the ARPA funding, uh, there was 90, 90 million dollars in um, in what is called uh, homelessness housing, rapid housing to build for homeless and moderate to low income uh, Vermonters. Also transitioning to a larger uh, shelter capacity, about 12 million dollars into that. In this transition year, and we think it's going to be a year to transition because you can't bring all of that um, housing stock up in, in a total in one year, uh, there's going to be a transition year. We have 
um, estimated that we'd use fund, uh, about $36 million in federal funding to do a transition. And that transition means that those that meet certain criteria, we're putting criteria back into the program, both income criteria and other criteria into the program, once you put those, uh, uh, once you put those rules back into the program, there are going to be some that are not eligible for the hotel motel program. In fact, about a third will be eligible for this program going forward. So that 36 million is in the transition year from um, this year to the permanent uh, housing aspects that we're trying to do through the governor's recommend. The, the one thing that we are doing is we're building capacity so uh, in shelter capacity, so I think we'll have shelter capacity. Also, some of, um, some of the uh, individuals probably won't meet the income, uh, the income uh, criteria that we're going to put in place. The last thing uh, we're doing is helping them uh, with stipends to help them uh, get deposits for rent, for example, for deposits for electricity, for apartments. We have a thing called ERAP, which is a, um, a subsidy uh, for housing, and we've got substantial increases in that ERAP uh, for for housing, as we for rental assistance as we move forward. We have also the capacity. Um, many of these people had housing before the pandemic hit, and as you know, as we sort of restricted in the early parts of the pandemic, they were living with relatives or friends. Um, households sort of constricted. Now, as we open up and, and pe more and more people get vaccinated, they may have opportunities to um, be housed with relatives or friends. We're helping them actually obtain those opportunities. So we think we have a, a good plan. The advocates think we have a good plan moving forward, and the legislature thinks we have a good plan. But it is, it is, um, it is pivotal, pivotal that we really. Um, concentrate on making sure that we um, pivot this plan to a really um, sustainable, permanent housing, which the governor has funded in his plan. And I think it's important as we move forward, that's got to be critical, is permanent housing for these individuals. Thank you. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, this is also a question for Secretary Smith. You said today that the uh, residency requirement to get a vaccine would be lifted this week. Wasn't that already lifted earlier this month when you said out-of-state workers could get vaccinated? Could you clarify that? No, we had, um, we had not had unrestricted um, uh, use of uh, uh, people being able to be vaccinated. We had people that had that could be vaccinated that worked in Vermont. We had people that intended to stay in Vermont for a certain time. We had part-time residents that were, but this is this is unrestricted. If if you want a vaccine and you happen to be in Vermont, you can get a vaccine. Okay, thank you. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Governor, you've probably heard enough questions on uh, emergency orders, so I'm going to switch uh, bases. And uh, this might be a question that Commissioner Herring can, can respond to. Um, last year, parents were given uh, the option of enrolling their students to full in-person learning uh, or hybrid system or remote learning. Up in Orleans County, uh, the parents who chose remote learning uh, had to keep their children enrolled in that program through the entire school year. Uh, for those parents who are drawing unemployment, um, if they go through a job search in good faith, is there any provisions that allow them to do the job search but not have to accept the job until the school year ends so they can continue uh, uh, to take care of their, their kids? Commissioner Harrington. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you, Governor. Um, the, so the way the work search is designed is it, the provisions for the work search come out of the original Act 91, 
uh, statute, which really says you have to fall into one of these categories, um, one, to have expanded eligibility into UI, but two, um, you know, for, for our standpoint, uh, a way to exempt people from completing, needing to complete the work search. So if, if a parent is home because the school is impacted by COVID-19, uh, whether there uh, is an outbreak uh, or if they do remote learning either in, in totality or on a hybrid model and they're staying home uh, for their kids uh, during the time in which the school is doing remote work, uh, then they only need to look for work um, if, they, if there are other parts um, of that time when they aren't uh, uh, out of work due to that COVID circumstance. So uh, again, uh, if they are um, they're out of work uh, because they have uh, two days a week, they're home with their child um, doing remote learning, but employed the rest of the week, um, then they don't have to do uh, the work search. If they're out of work completely um, and only two of those days are covered because of their child is doing remote learning, um, then the, they do need to look for work for those other, um, other hours of the week. Um, to the point about whether or not uh, someone chooses to remove their child from school in, uh, completely for the season or for the, for the school year um, to do homeschooling, um, you know, that, that is a, was a personal choice of that individual. The way we interpret uh, those circumstances or have interpreted those circumstances is that those individuals, um, if they want to continue to collect unemployment benefits um, because of that, that choice, then they would need to look for work if, they're, if they voluntarily um, uh, chose to provide working at home uh, for their child. Would there be uh, any... Uh... I was just going to point out that um, all of these provisions also are only in place during um, the traditional school year, um, and that is not necessarily uh, different under COVID. Um, you know, there are times when the school uh, is on recess or summer break, um, and so in those circumstances, um, you know, the, the individual, uh, the question really becomes what would you do traditionally during the time when the school was on summer break uh, and um, would you be employed during that time um, and what has, uh, if anything, what has changed um, out of the normal uh, summer schedule. Okay. And, and is there any uh, provision if there's a uh a medical reason to keep your, your uh, child at home and home and, uh, for remote learning? Yeah, so again, um, there is, and that really speaks back to um, whether or not um, the individual who's receiving un un unemployment is out of work because they themselves um, have either contracted COVID-19 and need to quarantine or were exposed <clears throat> and need to quarantine, or if they, they have a medical condition um, that temporarily is removing them from the workplace. Likewise, um, if they are caring for a loved one, you know, whether it's a child or another family member, um, and they are temporarily displaced. I think the, the hard part and the challenge for folks will be, um, you know, those really have to be temporary circumstances. Um, and as pe more people are vaccinated, um, you know, it will, it will turn into whether or not someone is eligible um, because they are temporarily out of work or they have a long-term circumstance, in which case um, there may be another benefit out there that is more appropriate under, under those conditions. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. It's an excellent response, and uh, thank you, Governor. All right. Well, thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again on Friday.